Forum Młodych Dyplomatów zaprasza Państwa na podcast Rubierze Świata. Cześć, nazywam się Rafał Dobosz i miałem przyjemność uczestniczyć w konferencji naukowej Uniwersytetu Ekonomicznego w Krakowie This Time is Different – Post Pandemic Banking and Financial Markets. Podczas konferencji naukowej przeprowadziłem wywiad, czy też sesję Q&A z głównym gościem i panelistą wydarzenia, profesorem Polem Wachtelem z New York University Stern School of Business, znanym ekonomistą i ekspertem do spraw banków centralnych oraz polityki monetarnej. Zapraszam na zapis audio tejże rozmowy. So, firstly, is the current situation in the banking sector a prelude to a repeat of 2008, or should we uh, avoid such comparison? You're talking about the United States? Yes. Uh, no, I think the current situation in the banking sector is very different than, than 2008. Uh, 2008, uh, banking crisis emerged out of problems in the housing sector, which existed across the entire country. This is much, much, much more isolated. There are some specific banks with difficulties, but there's not a systemic crisis looming. Okay, thank you. Um, the second question would be, uh, if you could please shortly discuss the collapse of the SVB Bank uh, in the US and uh, identify the factors that led to its downfall and the implications for the global financial market and especially uh, uh, the issue of the uh, startup sector and has the innovation market become threatened? Okay. Uh, the SVB bank situation is, in a sense, very simple. Uh, with, when interest rates were extremely low, uh, banks were trying to look for assets which would earn a reasonable interest rate. SVB bank bought lots and lots of long-term government securities, 10, 20, 30-year government bonds. When interest rates began increasing a year ago, the market value of those bonds began to decline. So their assets are declining in value. They have to pay more interest on their liabilities and the bank had a mismatch which put it into real trouble. They had so many uh, uh, government bonds because they view them as risk-free, which they are if you hold them until maturity, uh, they, they, they view them as risk-free. They had lots of these bonds, and when people began to realize the situation they were in, people began withdrawing deposits from this bank. This bank had a particular problem with regard to its deposits as well. Uh, a large, large fraction of its deposits were large deposits by high-tech firms which were above the limit for deposit insurance. So those depositors had a particular reason to run because they weren't covered by deposit insurance very, very quickly because this bank was active in a small community where everybody talks to everybody else. It's the high-tech community, the entrepreneurs, this was their specialty, began to panic, and there was a run on the bank. Uh, the Fed has taken actions to prevent runs on other banks which might have similar problems, which is the reason why I don't think this is going to be a systemic crisis which will spread across the whole country. Okay, then the third question uh, is in the more in the European context. Uh, I would like to ask you what circumstances contributed to the collapse of Credit Suisse and what about the markdowns of Deutsche Bank for a while and how do these events affect the stability in the banking sector but in Europe? Okay, uh, this is a long-standing question. Uh, Deutsche Bank has been poorly managed and in, financial, and in financial difficulty for as long as I can remember. Uh, Credit Suisse as well has had problems for a long time. In both instances, these banks are nationally important. 
uh, both in a political sense and in an economic sense. And so regulators in both Switzerland and Germany are going to go to great lengths to make sure these banks don't disappear or go bankrupt. Uh, they've done that already. Deutsche Bank uh, has gone through all kinds of ups and downs and been very unprofitable for a long period of time. But with assistance from the Bundesbank, has stayed in business. Credit Suisse was mismanaged uh, I, I, for a number of years. And um, the Swiss National Bank sort of engineered this merger to make sure there were no losses from, from, from that, that bank. Uh, I think these are specific problems. I don't think they indicate anything systemic about European banking generally. Uh, I, I think they just took the consequences of poor management for a long period of time. All right, thank you. I think that my fourth question actually was pretty much answered already, but I would like to ask you about the broader context here and uh, what are the main trends in the banking sector that have influenced those events? And I am looking for a cause and effect sequence. So if you could please consider the role of the COVID-19, the pandemic, uh, the war in Ukraine and the impact of rising inflation, as well as the Uh, the reaction of the central banks to that? Whew, that's a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, that's, uh, that, that, that's, that's, that's okay. I think the most significant factors are the ones we've spoken about already, which is with respect to these large European banks, poor management, exacerbated by higher interest rates exacerbated by the uncertainty coming about from the war in the Ukraine. Uh, in the United States, uh, basically it was a bank which did, a, in terms of Silicon Valley Bank, a bank which did a very poor job managing its own risk. It deserved to go out of business because, okay. because, because the management was not competent. Okay, that's a, that's a strong opinion, definitely. <laughs> um, so I, I also think that the fifth question doesn't make much sense now, as you mentioned that these are like more incidental issues with specific banks. But the question is, is the financial system prepared for a potential crisis? Can we effectively prevent it? or act and look for a remedy and uh, having the lessons from 2008 crisis uh, have they been made and are there mechanisms such as deposit guarantee fund or uh, requirements and regulations from the basel free uh, legislature and are, are those sufficient to secure stability and the interest of the various entities <laughs> um. I don't think we are approaching another systemic crisis, either in the European banking system or in the American banking system. We showed with COVID that there's a willingness and an ability on the part of both central banks and governments to respond to crisis. You know, if you look back at the 2008 crisis, Uh, we were really on the edge. You know, you, you know the, 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 the financial system, uh, the world financial system, uh, particularly in the UK and the United States, was really close to stopping to work. And it, was, and it took a great deal of effort to quickly put together responses to prevent that from happening. I mean, I think back to the period between September 2008 and about January 2009, which was the systemic crisis was going on. I don't think I, you know, I was the, you know, teaching at the time. I wasn't aware of how dangerous that situation was, and it was very dangerous. When the COVID crisis came along, central banks responded very quickly. Uh, it was an economic shock. The world economy sort of closed down 
for six months uh, or more, but it wasn't a financially threatening crisis in the same way. We have the tools. Uh, question you asking, though, is whether the regulatory tools, like deposit insurance, capital requirements, are adequate to prevent future crises from occurring. Uh, we thought so after the 2008 crisis, that the reforms that took place in both Europe and the United States really improved the, the quality of bank supervision and bank regulation. I, I'm not sure, 100% sure that's the case, but we do have improvements uh, that have taken place in both jurisdictions. All right, thank you. So now let's move about the uh, more about the part of cultural uh, impact of that. And the first question would be if you could briefly analyze the impact of current events on citizens' trust in the banking sector uh, and whether they are able to face such challenges. And also the question, what can we expect uh, where there be some changes in the products and their price available in the retail banking? Mm. I, I, I come from the United States. Clearly, that's most of my experience. I don't have a sense in the United States that there is any increase or, or any lack of trust in the banking system uh, as a consequence of the COVID crisis and what's happened over the last year or two. Uh, I can't speak for Europe in, 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 in that respect, uh, but I don't think even the Ukraine war has had an enormous impact on confidence in the banking system of countries other than Russia and the Ukraine, obviously. Uh, but I don't think it's had an enormous consequence on, on, on conf confidence in, say, the Polish banking system. All right, thank you. Um, the seventh question would be uh, kind of the same, but in relation to participants in investment markets, both individual and in institutional, uh, are we dealing with a crisis of confidence in bank and the stability of the system in that region? I don't think we're dealing with a crisis of confidence in the banks. I think we're dealing with a uh, political crisis, which makes the whole economy subject to enormous amounts of risk. But I would add here that in the 2008, I think that the issue was the MBS product, which was kind of complex financial product. And then today we have struggling, the SVB was struggling with the simplest product of all, the long-term government bonds. So it seems like none of the products, of course, simplifying things, are actually safe. So doesn't that concern in some of the investors? Investors in the banks or depositors you're talking about? I'm speaking about possibly any scenario, both individual from the just daily traders up to huge hedge funds, etc. Of course, the hedge funds are not very, yeah. they have huge risk appetite, but... I, I, I don't think that um, you know, the banking system uh, is uh, creating products which are uh, inherently much riskier than they ought to be. That was the case with the complex housing-related, mortgage-related securities in the early 2000s. The, the question with SVB Bank was really just bad management. Uh, as you say, it was a very, a very simple structure poor, with poor judgment on the part of the management of that particular bank. All right. Uh, then, in a more geopolitical context, if you could please discuss the role of various institutions, such as the Fed, uh, Swiss National Bank and ECB uh, in responding to current uh, uh, banking events and their impact on the, uh, the balance of power in the global financial market. The question is, what are they doing? 
are they doing it effectively and at whose cost is that? <laughs> These are very complex questions. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, you know, the, 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 there have been enormous efforts uh, since, um, since um, the 2008 crisis to improve bank regulation and supervision, uh, particularly in Europe. Uh, by the European Banking Authority, uh, and whether these, and surely these have improved the situation, whether they've solved all problems, probably not. In the United States, there were improvements in the Dodd-Frank legislation, which was passed in 2010, soon after the, 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 the financial crisis, but there have been a number of respects where the um, improvements in supervision have been dialed back. Uh, and that, that even relates to the Silicon Valley Bank, which was uh, not subject to as much supervision as it should have been. And that was probably a mistake in the United States, relaxing some of the supervisory constraints from the Dodd-Frank Act. All right, thank you. The, the last two questions pretty much relate to Poland, but let's give them a try. Okay. Um, so, uh, 2008 financial crisis, the Poland was considered, at least in, in inside our country, as a kind of green island. What I suspect, and I think many of economists would agree, is that we didn't have much of a capital ties with the other countries, so the, the spillover effect was not really strong on us. And... Do you know maybe how the, the, the Poland role in the banking system or the financial system has changed? So if the potential financial crisis would come, would, be, would we be impacted this time? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no problem at all. Uh, that, that, that's too, too specific to Poland about why Poland uh, was l relatively unaffected in 2008 and whether it would be more affected by a future financial crisis, uh, I, I, I don't know. Sure, no problem. The last one is also about the general trends, but I give the example of Poland, but also let's, let's give it a try. So lastly, can, you, can we ask uh, for a note of uh, optimism? It seems that citizens are interested in two economic issues mostly, low inflation, and high employment rate. Uh, we have been getting used to the loss of the former uh, for months now, and for the latter, however, it does not seem to be threatened in the short or even medium term. Uh, is it more? It is more development of AI that raises concerns here. Well, first of all, uh, you know, uh, inflation had been very tame for a, for more than a generation, and people forget. Uh, people forget how rapidly inflationary expectations can, can develop and change. And I was saying this back right as soon as the COVID inflation began to take place, that once we experience it, it's going to be very difficult to get rid of it. And that turns out to be the case. But I do think that the central banks of the world are determined to stabilize prices, maybe not bring inflation back to the 1% to 2% range it had been in, but clearly to bring, bring inflation back to the 2 3 3.5% range where it should be. Um, and then the question is whether that can be done without generating a uh, serious recession? There's no clear answer to that. The, there is a good possibility that we will have a recession. I suspect the world economy by the end of this year will be contracting. I, I don't think we will have the kind of recession that took place after the 2008 financial crisis. Central banks will work very hard to uh, give us a smooth landing, though it might not be completely smooth. 
All right. I would love to ask some more questions, but unfortunately, that's all that I have prepared. So thank you very okay. much for the... some of them were difficult. <laughs> uh, I hope my answers were clear enough to be useful.